Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Wright, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. The patient in this procedure attended with occluding earwax in both ears. This is a pre-procedure examination of the right ear. You can see the wax is fully occluding, so it's completely sealing the ear canal all the way around the perimeter of the canal wall. Um, the patient is very prone to uh, developing ear infections, so they have chronic ear infections, which means uh, they have to completely avoid water, which we should all should be doing anyway. Water's bad for the ear. Uh, water's, uh, on this, uh, I describe it as a kryptonite of the ear. So can't, he has to be extra cautious to avoid water in his ears. And in the past, he's used all forms of earwax drops, such as olive oil, hydrogen peroxide, sodium bicarbonate, and he's sensitive to all of those. So um, we've had to remove this bilateral occlusion without the assistance of any drops. And you'll see uh, the drops would have been very useful and handy on several occasions during the procedure. So we just have to plow, plow our way through. So it's a bit of an epic journey here, uh, hence the name, an epic earwax removal. So. Started to use the zonal suction probe. The wax, which is more lateral, is which is we're right near the entrance here at the moment. And we know that because of all the cilia, all the hairs. The hairs in the ear are only found, or only should be found in the outer third. That's where the follicles, hair follicles, are found in the cartilaginous portion. So this wax, which is very lateral, it's got a bit of a softer consistency. Uh, you can see here, I'm lifting it off the base of the ear canal. You can see a thick layer of keratin. So there's a, a some dead skin here that's also adhered to the wax, which is on the posterior canal wall. And when you've got a wax of this consistency, it's quite difficult to, to vacuum. I call this the clay type of wax. Uh, I did use an ear hook as well, and you can see that just slides straight through. So what I'm trying to do is just trying to manipulate this wax, trying to mobilize it. And we do that by trying to detach it, elevate it from the canal walls. You can also see there's a few hairs uh, attached to the surface of the wax, a bit of matted hairs there. Um, uh, the patient, again, has been trimming their ear hairs. Um, if you've been watching my videos, um, I always recommend if you do trim your ear, ear hairs, so you shave them, always put a bit of cotton wool, not in your ear, but just at the entrance. You want to seal the canal wall, uh, entrance so these hairs don't fly loose into the ear, because if they do, they mat against the wax, they cause a, create a matrix. It's hard to remove. So I'm just now using a Jobson horn, a correct, and I'm just getting digging into it. So the head of the spoon, so a correct is almost like a hollow spoon, and it is angled forward, I think about 30 degrees. And what I did, I just angled the, the, the tip of the head of this correct into the wax and slowly brought the correct forwards, the Jobson horn forwards. You have to be very careful is when you bring the Jobson horn forwards, or for the ear hook for that matter, it's very easy to dig into the base of the ear canal and scratch it. Oh, you can cut it, uh, make it bleed, and it has happened to me before. So you've got to be very, very careful when you manipulate these instruments and you, you bring it out. You can see I'm kind of funneling through, I'm tunneling through the wax. Um, so the Jobson horn has been quite useful at this stage. Uh, because we're on the outer third, the cartilaginous portion, if we do come in contact with the canal wall, it's less sensitive for the patient. If this uh, correct um, or ear hook comes in contact with the inner two thirds of the ear canal, the bony part can be very uncomfortable for the patient, so we do have to be a bit more cautious. So now I've just gone back in with the suction probe, uh, probably about a centimeter into the ear at the moment. You can see this wax is coated with some dead skin. You can see that skin, it's a glossy, light brown color uh, all the way around the edge. The skin here, so posteriorly, so to the back part of the ear canal, is a lot thicker than the opposite side. So I'm just manipulating this. And you can see the skin over time has got a bit damp and it's got a bit soggy, and it's again, it's a horrible consistency to remove. If we put some drops in the ear at this stage, it would have been very, very useful. You can see all that keratin there. So, what is keratin? So, ker keratin is a natural protein. Um, and it's found uh, on the, in the skin cells in our ear, on our fingernails, our hair strands. So the ear canal itself, it's lined with a layer of skin. Uh, the skin lines the entire ear canal and it also lines, lines the outer, most lateral, so we mean lateral towards us near the entrance, layer of the eardrum. So the eardrum has got three membranes. 
and the skin and the inner two thirds in particular, we call that stratified squamous epithelial keratinous skin. So if we break down that terminology, stratified means layers. Okay, so I believe, if I'm correct, the skin in the ear canal has five layers. Squamous is these skin cells are, are like pancakes, they're flat. They're not like rectangular in shape or cuboid in shape, they're, they're flat and they layer upon each other. Epithelial is the outer layer of skin uh, and the inner, so as I said, we've got five layers of skin. The, the most deepest layer, which is almost in contact with the epidermis, it's got a good rich blood supply. Um, but as these skin cells die, and uh, sorry, as they multiply, so uh, with uh, meiosis and mitosis, and um, these, these um, skin cells multiply, so I think it's mitosis, not meiosis, they duplicate, in other words. As they duplicate, the, the sister cell uh, is remains at the base and the parent cell gets pushed upwards onto the, the next layer and that that kind of pushing forwards of the skin continues and when this the parent cell, skin cell the original skin skin cell that was originally on the base the innermost of the five skin layers uh, deep in the ear canal when that reaches a surface less blood supply so that skin begins to die and all the fluid, all the intracellular fluid that makes up all cells in our body, on this outermost parent skin cell, there's less fluid retention. So um, the, skin, that, the skin becomes drier, um, it loses, it dies and it wilts. And it's the space where all that intracellular fluid used to be is filled up with a protein called uh, keratin. Um, Keratin actually is it's very uh, useful in the ear though. It's got hydrophobic properties, so it helps repel water. We don't want water penetrating the ear canal and the innermost layers of skin in the ear canal because that can lead to an infection. Um, it also, this keratin uh, helps uh, reflect radiation. So um, this, uh, all the UV light from the sun, so it provides a protective barrier. And as this, outer parent cell that originally was uh, formed in the, the innermost layer, so remember we said five layers, as that dies and sheds it naturally sh migrates sideways out of the ear. If it didn't then everyone's ears, and that's everyone's ears would be full of dead skin. If you've got dead skin on your finger or your arm or your scalp uh, through friction, so hand movements when you shower, these skin cells fall off and they fall on the floor. In your ear, if the skin simply died and shed and fell, it will collect in your ear canal and everyone will be well, hard of hearing. So the ear has, has, the, has adapted over millennia with the unique property, in most people anyway, as the skin dies and sheds, so as this uh, stratified, squamous, epithelial, keratinous skin so just it's got it's quite a long jargon I, and i appreciate that but a lot of the viewers um who watch my uh, youtube channel are actually med students or geology students so hence why i'm trying to explain it in layman terms but also use the correct terminology at the same time um, as that dies it, uh, it naturally migrates sideways like a conveyor belt so it, if, for example, we were to get a black marker and make a mark on this patient's eardrum, and if we get this patient back every two weeks, every fortnight, you will see that black mark, which was originally in the centre of the eardrum, would move sideways, um, and then it will reach the tip of the eardrum, and it will come on the side of the ear canal. And after three and a half months, four months, that black marker would be probably more lateral to be on the outer part of the ear canal and that's because that black marker on that skin that skin's died it's shedded it's moving sideways and it's taking that black marker with it and in the same way that's why the skin is very important for the migration of earwax as the skin migrates out of the ear the earwax that sits on top of the skin also comes out of the ear and for the majority of the population so i'll say 92 to 95 percent of the population earwax is not a problem we all have it we all secrete it but it comes out naturally it's that five to eight percent um, of the population where the skin no longer migrates and it causes a buildup of wax and so I hope that was interesting and it explains how the ear works um, now 
When, that's why we always say don't use cotton buds, don't use Q-tips, because not only are you forcing the wax further into the ear, but you're also grazing the ear canal wall. And when you graze the ear canal wall, you're, you're, you're killing, you're uh, scraping the outermost layer of keratinous skin, which is important because, as I said, as that skin dies and sheds, it migrates sideways. But if you're, and it's a transport mechanism, the wax that sits on top of the skin comes out. But if you're grazing that skin, you're breaking that conveyor belt motion and this wax can no longer migrate and ironically um, when you graze the skin uh, when that skin regrows you get an itchy feeling in your ear which then makes you wanting to use a cotton bud again or a q-tip so it's a vicious cycle um, so I've cleared this uh, immense blockage. Sorry, I didn't talk too much about the procedure because it was just self-explanatory. You'll see what I was doing. Uh, what I'm doing now is just this dead. There's a layer of dead skin. It's it's it is dead. It's just not migrated. I'm trying to remove as much as possible. But I believe this patient developed the chloric effect, so I had to stop. So the symptoms are completely alleviated now. The eardrum's fully visible. It's healthy, but there's a lot of dry skin. I think I stopped at that point, and the reason why. So whilst you're watching this left ear, so we've gone to the left ear and you'll just see me similarly to the right ear, just kind of funnel my way through this wax. And again, if you've not, if you didn't watch the beginning of the video, we can't use drops with this patient because the patient is sensitive to drops. He's had reactions in the past to all types of drops, whether it's olive oil based or um, sodium bicarbonate based or hydrogen peroxide. Um, so yeah, on the right side, I had to stop the procedure. Although I'm happy with that, we, we cleared the occlusion. That's why the patient came here. They could hear significantly better. But at that final stage, when I was trying to clear some of that dead skin, they developed the caloric effect. So in each of our ears, in the inner ear, we have the organ of balance, and we call that the vestibular system. And it's made up of three semicircular canals, superior canal, uh, horizontal, and posterior. And these three canals are filled with fluid and hair cells, similar to the hair cells and fluid in the organ of the room, the cochlea. And when we move our head, uh, fluid in these um, different uh, semicircular canals move, move sideways. And depending upon the velocity and the direction of the movement of the fluid, it, it tells our brain that we're moving in a certain direction. So that gives us our sense of balance. Now, the organ of balance uh, can be affected by temperature and pressure. So if we focus on temperature, if we increase the ear temperature by a couple of degrees, I believe, I think it's a couple of degrees, or probably, I think, probably 39 degrees, so it's quite, uh, yeah, so at 39 you will have a fever, for example, but just say we artificially increase the temperature of the ear, we can do that, actually we do that as part of our balance assessments, we either put warm water in, but water's bad, as I said, for the ear, or nowadays they use warm um, air, and what that does, an increase of temperature in the ear causes the organ of balance in that ear to become overly excited. Okay, we almost turbo boost it. And because we turbo boost it and you're not actually physically moving, your organ of balance in that ear is telling the brain that you're moving because we've excited the balance organ, but you're not. And that leads to uh, a dizziness, it leads to vertigo, feeling the room spinning around. We call that the caloric effect. Conversely, if we decrease the temperature in the ear, which what is what happens when we perform microsuction, so when we suction the ear, it reduces the ear temperature, it inhibits the organ of balance in that ear. So that organ of balance becomes almost dormant, it, it becomes um, less sensitive. And because of then the opposite ear, has got uh, the organ of balance in the opposite ear is more active than the ear that we're performing microsuction in. Because remember, when we perform microsuction in the ear, because it reduces the ear temperature, it almost makes that organ of balance in that ear dormant, it puts it to sleep. But the opposite side is functioning normally, so inversely, your brain's still getting mixed messages from both ears, from both organ of balances, telling. So the brain interprets that when the brain receives mixed information from both ears from the both organ of balance, it means that your brain interprets that as that you're moving in a certain direction, but obviously you're not, the patient's not moving, the patient's stationary, we're just in their ear and they're very still. And that causes the patient to suffer from vertigo, the room spinning around. And eventually your eyes correct your, 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 your brain, it tells your brain, don't trust your, don't trust your ears, your organs, organ of balance in your ears are not providing you with accurate information, and the eyes step in and uh, take control, but we call that the caloric effect.
Also, as the air regains its natural temperature, its core temperature, then that caloric effect is also um, inhibited and the patient no longer experiences vertigo. So just in the left ear, we're making good progress here. We're just halfway into the ear canal, and but the wax is very impacted and it's the consistency of this wax is a soft clay. It's probably one of the worst consistencies of wax because there's no one micro instrument that is suitable for it really. Suction, uh, because it's impacted, it's very hard to get suction grit and it can clog up the suction probe. An ear hook and jobs and horn just slices through this wax because the consistency is too soft. You can't use forceps. Um, forceps will just dissect this. Um, it's just off topic actually. I was just uh, watching a video yesterday. Someone's, um, someone published a video in America uh, I'm not going to mention the name, but um, it, they were just talking about earwax removal in general, and it was quite fascinating because they were actually endorsing um, ear irrigation as the primary method of professional earwax removal, which is really quite startling. Because in the UK, it's the complete opposite advice. Um, in the UK, earwax removal used to be performed in primary care. So when we say primary care, we mean in doctor surgeries by either a doctor or a nurse. And historically, doctors and nurses used to use uh, an old-fashioned metal syringe, and you would literally put that in the ear and squirt water um, at quite a velocity, quite a high pressure. And the theory is, with ear syringing, is that this water would hit the eardrum, basically, bounce back off, and as it bounces back off, uh, and as it comes back out of the ear, it flushes out any wax. That's actually banned in the UK, ear syringing. The only place where you'll see an old fashioned ear syringe in the UK is in, is in a museum. And what's fascinating is that when I, uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2015 or 16, I attended uh, the American Academy of Audiology International Conference. I think it was in San Antonio, Texas. And there was loads of exhibition stores there. And I went to a store where they were actually selling this ear syringe, and I was like, I went up to the store and I said, oh, so is this actually, are you genuinely selling this, or is it, uh, I, well, I did ask them, I didn't know what else to say, because I was just shocked, I couldn't believe it, and the chap said to me, is that in America, ear syringing with the old-fashioned metal syringe is, I think it depends on different states, but it's still, um, it's not banned, it's still used regularly, and I, that was quite shocking for me. Um, so in the UK, when they banned ear syringing, they've replaced that with a method called ear irrigation. And what ear irrigation is, it's a similar concept, you're using water, you're flushing it into the ear canal and you want the water to kind of hit the eardrum basically and bounce back out. And as it bounces back out, it flushes out any debris wax you may have in the ear canal. But the difference with an ear irrigation machine, it's, it's like a, a, a water pump. Uh, where you can actually take control of the pressure yourself, either electronically or using a manual foot pump. So what they use at the dentist, and in fact, it was all stemming from the dentist. I think a nurse, a dental nurse, said, well, you could actually use a, what we use to irrigate the mouth during dental procedures. Um, why not use that for flushing earwax out? Uh, and a nurse actually developed that concept. So the first ear irrigation machine in the UK, at least, was a dental irrigation machine. I suspect it's been adapted since um, for uh, the more specific requirements of the ear. So ear irrigation in the UK is far more less invasive than uh, ear syringing because you've got control of that uh, the flow of water. However, in the UK, ear irrigation is not frowned upon. I still think it has its uses now and again, but it's the gold standard in the UK, and it's not just uh, it, that's uh, as a professional audiologist, but also ENT specialist. The, the gold standard of wax removal is actually suction or removing wax using mechanical instrumentation, so ear hooks, jobs and horns, crocodile forceps. Very seldom in the UK now. I mean, a lot of GP practice in the UK no longer perform ear irrigation. Um, so it's not a service that's provided on the NHS anymore. So just you can see, we remove that final plug of wax. I'm just going to mop up. And yes, yeah, so most people in the UK they have far better outcomes with suction, and that's because some of the uh, 
ear irrigation and ear syringing has its limitations. It's a blind technique, so you can't really see what you're doing in the ear canal. Water, as I keep, if you've been watching my videos on my channel, you'll, you'll know I'm very anti-water in the ear. So uh, even if the water's sterile, it's, uh, there's some bacteria that naturally lives in the ear. And with the introduction of water, it can stimulate this bacteria, flora of bacteria, and it can cause lead to ear infections. Um, so we call that otitis externa. And I think the data is 5% of ear irrigations, uh, at least in the UK, I suspect, have some complications, most typically otitis externa. I've, got to, I've seen that data, I can't recite the exact scientific paper, but I've come across that several times during my, my research. Um, ear irrigation as well has the possibility of perforating the eardrum because of the pressure. Uh, and that's happened, I've had, I've had stories from nurses, um, some other practitioners who perform it, that they have had perforations. Ear irrigation or syringing cannot be formed in patients with a perforated eardrum um, or a ventilation tube or grommet because if this water enters the middle ear space, it can lead to an ear infection. So it can't. Bit of hair there, guys. We've left that. We've, we're not going to perf risk perforating the eardrum just remove that hair. Natural migrate, slight attic retraction. There's the contents of both ears. So I'm just going to let this still image play. I'm going to go back to the topic I was talking about irrigation. So yeah, you can't uh, perform irrigation in people with perforated eardrums, grommets, so ventilation tubes as they're known in the UK. So grommets are known in the UK and America, they're called ventilation tubes, as I think they are. Mastoid cavity, so when you've had ear surgery uh, and uh, the mastoid bone is drilled out, so that's the bone at the back of the, the ear canal. If people have had have got active ear infections or uh, ear infection um, in the last six weeks, it's advised against. You can't use irrigation in the UK uh, for foreign body removal, so cotton birds, marbles, any any foreign body ob object in the ear canal. Um, also, if you've had a perforated eardrum but it's healed, um, it has to be healed for I think for about eighteen months before in the UK you are allowed to perform. Uh, ear irrigation. Also, ear irrigation requires the need to soften the earwax using softening agents, so softening drops, earwax drops, sodium bicarbonate drops, hydrogen peroxide drops. Uh, typically in the UK, they advise that for 10 days. So for 10 days, someone's putting drops in constantly twice a day and it can exacerbate their symptoms because the wax absorbs the drops, it swells, expands. If you're a hearing aid wearer, it's more, more difficult. You may not be able to wear your hearing aid during that time period. Also, ir irrigation is also quite noisy. Um, it's an electronic pump, and I've had it done myself, because we see uh, myself and my previous co-founder of Clearwax, Mr. Darius Rajali, is an ENT surgeon. For us, it's very important to train ourselves on all methods of earwax removal, so we do endoscopic microsuction with a microscope. I prefer the endoscopic approach, as, as you're aware, but I've also trained myself in performing ear irrigation. I've had it done it myself because I think it's so important as a clinical ear care specialist that if you're performing procedures on other people, you have these procedures performing yourself, even if they're mock procedures. So you know what the patient is experiencing. I actually found ear irrigation quite noisy. And the justification in this, in this video that I saw yesterday, and it's only snippets, but I, I saw enough, was that um, microsuction is really noisy. Yes, it is can't deny that it is very noisy but irrigation actually wasn't far off um, I'm gonna probably do a little study where I can measure uh, the output of a microsuction tube in the ear and also that of irrigation I suspect microsuction is a bit noisier but there's ways of combating that you, you can you, 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 you take moments where you come out of the ear give the ear a rest so you're not exposing it for a prolonged period of time with the noise you can reduce the suction power there's different types of suction tubes. Remember ENT surgeons, when they're performing surgery in the ear, they, they use suction as well. They can be in the ear for a long, long time. I know the patient's asleep, but it can have the same effect of damaging the ear. Um, also, uh, I think they mentioned like if wax is stuck, hard ear wax is stuck in the canal wall, you can't use microsuction. Well, I, I kind of disagree with that. I think do that regularly if you've been watching my videos. Um, so it's, I, I think it's just a cultural thing. I think in America, ear care still primary method, at least by audiologists in America, is water-based. And reading a lot of the comments on my YouTube, that is the case. I think it's also true for Canada. But I think in the UK, I think we're a bit more involved, we're a bit more sophisticated, uh, we're a bit more with modern trends. And I think it's very rare you'll find an ENT surgeon in the UK performing ear irrigation with their patients, just because of the risks it provides. 
Most importantly, as I said, uh, for me, the major difference is when you're removing earwax, you want to be seeing what you're doing. And with, ear, uh, with uh, uh, microsuction or using mechanical instruments, using direct supervision, so an endoscope or microscope or head loops, wherever it may be, you can see, you're, you're able to see what you're doing. So it's performed under direct supervision, which is, I think is very, very important. Um, ear irrigation typically is a blind technique. Um, so yeah, uh, just thought I mentioned that because if other people are watching that video uh, and then if you if you watch my, you can sometimes get contra contrasting views and it's difficult for viewers to, to kind of decipher. I think it's always important just giving uh, the information and let the patient, let the public uh, make their own decision, make an informed decision. Whenever I give talks on earwax removal, I talk about all the procedures and I, I do give the pros and cons. So there is negatives to endoscopic earwax removal. Microsuction can be noisy, we're, we're not denying that, it's one of the risks. However, I think also in the UK, some of the data, you're more likely, so a loud sound not only can cause temporary or permanent hearing loss, it can also cause temporary or permanent tinnitus and I think in the UK at least um, some of the data suggests that a lot of one of the negatives of ear irrigation is the onset of tinnitus more so than microsuction. I can't remember how many procedures I've done in totality, it must be in the high, uh, almost got to the 10,000 10, mark. I, I don't, in terms of ears, I really, uh, I think minimum I've done four to 5,000 procedures. The only complications I've had really is I had two patients who had temporary tinnitus and it resolved. I've not had any real other complications. I had one lady that tried to claim that I damaged her hearing. I, they were trying to get a free hearing aid off me in the end. And when I challenged them and I explained, well, the patient already had a hearing loss in that ear. And because that's what the patient told me prior to attending. They said no, they, they've had they've got copies of hearing test results from elsewhere and I said, well, provide me with the copies. I did a free of charge hearing test as well. I said, if you can give me the hearing test prior to, to, to the procedure, which the patient prior to having the hearing test with me claimed that they did, um, we'll, we'll evaluate the situation. Obviously, we signed consent forms, it's so important. I recently had a, a, a by the way, that, that, that particular lady in the end never provided the copy of the hearing test results. They just wanted a free hearing aid off me and they made threats that they're going to file a lawsuit against me because I've damaged the hearing. We do consent forms here in the UK. I'm very vigilant with that. There is risk. Any procedure, there's a risk. And in the end, the patient was just telling a porky pie. Um, I've had a patient once who accused me of perforating the eardrum. Um, had the procedure recorded, so when I played it back, it was a pre-existing perforation, which they failed to notify me of. Uh, I think they were fully aware that they had a hole in the eardrum, but it was nothing that I did because I was just near the entrance, they were near the eardrum, and I wasn't even using suction. So I think they had egg on their face when I showed them the video back, uh, and they were very embarrassed. And recently, I had to cancel an appointment with a patient. Uh, it was only a few weeks back, Sorry, I've gone a bit off tangent a bit. Um, I hope you don't mind. Uh, patient booked in for his wife uh, because of, uh, we, we send an electronic consent form. Obviously, if they're not, they've got any queries, we ask them to contact us prior to signing it. And they can sign it online and we get it automatically emailed back. The husband wrote back saying, well, this is all of a palaver. Why do we need a consent form? And it happened that they were a lawyer. Uh, and his justification is, well, what we do is very straightforward. He had it syringing performed, called it syringing a few years ago, he didn't have to sign a consent form, uh, it was a relatively straightforward procedure and I think his, his exact words were what I'm doing at my clinic was, um, what did he say, breaking a, a walnut with a sledgehammer, in other words going OTT. So my responses were so this is the way we do our practice here. Uh, consent, I would actually say that the previous practitioner was doing wrong by not explaining all the potential risks, because there is risk. Every procedure's got risk, and it's our duty to inform the patient, which then gives them uh, all the information for them to make an informed decision as to whether they want the procedure being performed. So I said, actually, I think their, their previous specialist was wrong, not explaining the risks. Uh, and if they obviously if they're not happy with the way we do things and if they think we are going to they're more than welcome to obviously we can cancel the point i can give a refund and they can go to their previous practitioner they're very reluctant to do that
but they were still almost refusing to sign a consent form. Um, and for me, if you don't sign a consent form, we don't do the procedure. I mean, that's a standard procedure in the UK. It really is. We live in a world of litigation. Things can go wrong. Uh, fortunately, touch wood, as of yet, apart from those few instances, nothing has. But I've got to be frank and honest. I think when you're doing stuff like endoscopic earwax removal or any form of earwax removal, there are there are risks attached, and um, there will be complications. I was speaking to uh, an ENT surgeon, and and he openly admitted that yes, um, they've performed a procedure and they've perforated the eardrum, or they've cut the ear and it's profuse bleeding. Um, Fortunately, the, the, the perforation healed, um, so things do go wrong and um, yes, in the end I had to cancel the appointment with the patient. Um, I said this is the way our, this is the, what we do, this is our policies and procedures and when I train people, we, we can't emphasise enough to give the patient the information they require in order to consent to a procedure. Consent is a big, big thing in the UK. As I suspect it is in America, I think both countries live in a world of litigation. Anyway, guys, I went off tangent there. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Uh, obviously, you could have, if, if it was boring you, you could have just muted it or ended the video after the procedure. Take care. Speak to you all soon. Bye.